Hi, this is Estates and Trusts uh, online module about the rule against perpetuities. I am Professor Donna Byrne. Background. You should already be comfortable with the concept of a contingent future interest and you should be comfortable with the concept of a class gift and be able to determine when a class will close. Now, for this set of materials, and I will be splitting this into two videos, so this one will end kind of in the middle and then there will be another one. Um, we're going to work on the common law rule against perpetuities. We'll, we'll say what it is, we'll explain when it applies, we will apply it to determine the validity of future interests, and then we will also look at how class closing relates to the rule against perpetuities. These videos will not actually um, apply talk about the typical reform statutes. There is material in your casebook about that. So to begin with, first this rule only applies if we have a future interest and it's a contingent interest. So ask yourself first of all, is this a future interest? And then ask, is it contingent? Are there things that have to happen before the interest will vest? Just like in the old mousetrap game, there were things that had to happen in order for that cage to land on the mouse. Now, when is an interest contingent? It's contingent if the beneficiary is not born, or the beneficiary is not ascertainable, or there's some condition precedent. Now, make a, make, make a distinction here. We're talking about a condition that has to occur in order for the interest to vest, okay? Not an interest subsequent that will come in to divest. So here is the common law rule against perpetuities. No interest is good unless it must vest, if at all, not later than 21 years after some life and being at the creation of the interest. Let's read it again. No interest is good unless it must vest, if at all, not later than 21 years after, this, after some life and being at the creation of the interest. It's like poetry. Now, the important part is this here, life in being at the creation of the interest. Focus on that. When was the interest created? We'll start with that because we're going to be asking at the beginning whether we can be sure about vesting within the right time period. Well, if this is an inter vivos trust, the interest, each interest, the future interests, all of them, are created at the beginning, at the execution of the trust. If it's a testamentary trust, however, they are all created at the death of the testator, right, when the will begins to speak. And we've talked about powers of appointment. If the interest is created by, a pow by, the, by exercise of a power of appointment, if the power was a general power, the interest dates to the, cre to the exercise of the power. But if the power was a non-general power, then usually we're going to go back to the creation of the power and that's the point at which we have to ask this question. So it gets a little tricky. Now do check your statutes. Some states change this also to the exercise of the power. Okay, so for each contingent future interest, now here, here's how we go about it. Who are the individuals around at the creation of the interest? Those people we're going to call lives in being. It's a dorky label. We just need a label. Maybe we'll call them libs, lives in being, the people who were around at the creation of the interest. Second question, when will we know how to fill in the blank and then to so-and-so, right? When will we be able, when we know that we're going to be able to fill that in, that we're going to write a check to somebody? So we might look around and say, okay, well then, who are the people whose lives, deaths, or activities will help us fill in that blank? We're going to call them affecting lives. Now sometimes we won't be looking for affecting lives, we'll be looking for affecting events. But the tricky ones are the ones where we have to look for affecting lives. Some of those affecting lives will also be lives in being, hopefully. Um, let me take me out. Right. Some of the affecting lives are lives in being. If they're not, then we don't make it. So we're looking for that overlap of lives in being and affecting lives. We have to know that the interest will vest or fail within the lifetime of one of the lives in being at the creation of the interest. 
plus a kind of grace period of 21 years. Focus on the lives, not the 21 years. Focus on the lives. 21 years is just a grace period. Because once the lives are over, then we still have that. But we have to know from the beginning that the interest will vest or fail by then. We're not waiting to see what happens. Okay, here's an example. To my son for life, and then to the middle graduate of William Mitchell at the June graduation following my son's death. Okay, who's a life and being here? Well, the son, right? This is a person that we can identify who's mentioned. When will we know who to write the check to? It's going to be after son dies, but not immediately. It'll be at that next June graduation. So it's at son's death plus a little, but we're focusing on the life and being. We're focusing on son. So who can affect vesting here? Son. Son is also a life and being, so that's good news. We just need to know about that extra time until the next June graduation. How long is that going to be? Well, it couldn't be more than 12 months, um, assuming there's a June graduation every year. Do we know that for sure? Let's pretend that we do, okay? So the rule gives us up to 21 years after the end of the affecting life and being. Um, we're going to have our answer within a year. So, so this interest is valid, right? Because it's going to vest for sure um, within a year of son's death, right? It's by the June following son's death. Now, notice that if son is someone who's very young, say an infant, that could be a really long time. So it's not the length of time per se. It's this lifetime plus a little bit. Okay, here's another example. Judith's will includes a gift to my youngest child who shall be living 35 years after the death of my friend Chris. And Judith has two children, Anthony and Beth. Um, and Chris, the friend Chris, has survived Judith. Now, I'm hoping for the sake of these kids, whoops, go back. I'm hoping that Chris is a person who is advanced in years. Otherwise, we're going to be waiting a very, very long time to see who's around him. Okay, so who are the lives in being? Well, the children. This is Judith's will, right? So Judith is dead. So there aren't going to be any more children. So we've got the, the only children that matter. And Chris. Now, the interest can only vest in one of those children. Here's this rule. Any interest that can only vest in a life in being is valid. We're there. Done. We don't care about the 35 years. It doesn't matter because we're going to vest in one of those people. Or not. Right? If they both die before Chris, before 35 years after death of Chris, then those interests fail. But... Um, we will know within the lifetimes of these two children. Now go. Okay. Here's another example. Carrie's will gave property to City Hospital for its general purposes. But if the hospital ever ceases to operate, to Mark, if he is then alive. And Mark, in, in fact, survives Carrie, right? But the hospital now gets the property. Well... Here again, this future interest can only vest in Mark, and um, only if he's still alive. Mark is a life in being. An interest that can only vest in a life in being is valid, because we're focusing on the lives. How about this one? Thomas left property to Michelle for life, remainder to Michelle's children, but if Michelle dies without issue, remainder to Eric. And at Thomas's death, Michelle did survive unmarried and childless, and I should say, and so did Eric. Well, who are the lives in being? Michelle, Eric. When will we know who takes this remainder, right? Uh, either Michelle's children or Eric or his estate. We will know for sure at Michelle's death. Because at that point, either her children take or Eric does. There aren't any other options. Notice that Eric does not actually have to survive in this case. But we'll know at Michelle's death. 
if the interest will definitely vest or fail at the end of a life in being, it is valid. So here's a second rule that you can always use. So we've got two, right? The one we just saw, if the interest will definitely vest or fail at the end of a life in being, it's valid. And an interest that can only vest in a life in being is valid. All right, here's another example. Jason's trust goes to Amanda for life, remainder to Amanda's first child who reaches age 30. Okay, who are the lives in being? Well, Amanda, when will we know who takes? Whenever it is that a child of Amanda's reaches 30. Hmm. Okay, let's think about this one. Okay, when Amanda's child reaches 30, doesn't really depend on the life or death of anyone alive at the beginning of the interest. Right? Amanda's job is only to produce the children, um, give them a good start, but whether they make it to 30 or not, that doesn't have to do with her being alive or dead. So what if, um, what if Amanda has a child this year and then uh, dies, unfortunately, in childbirth? And then we would have the situation where the only life in being, which was Amanda, is gone, and we're still going to have to wait 30 years. Now, if we're focusing on the life, the life part is over. Our grace period is only 21 years. So that was invalid. In fact, if Amanda does not have any children who've already, re already reached age 30, this interest is invalid. Even if she has some children who are not very old, she could have another child, like she did in the last example, and then she and the older children could meet a King Roth disaster. Remember this? All the lives in being, all at one time, gone. And then we're waiting for this newcomer that we can't even imagine at the beginning of the interest. All right, somebody who wasn't even born yet. So there are a lot of possibilities here. I'm going to take myself out of this one. Oops, go back. Um, if Amanda already has a child age 30, we're good. If Amanda has children who are over age 9 and one reaches 30 within 21 years of Amanda's death, that would vest the interest in time. Or if Amanda were to die childless, that would fail the interest in time. On the other hand, the interest would vest too late if Amanda were to die leaving a child under age 9. Or if Amanda has a baby and dies in childbirth and then all her other children die too, then we would be waiting for a, an afterborn. Here's the thing. If we can think of one possibility in this list, then the interest is invalid. If we can think of one possibility that makes it not work, the interest is invalid. Here's the link to that King Ralph trailer in case you want to see it again. Um, again, what we have to imagine is the unexpected demise of multiple generations of the same family. We have to imagine that this could happen. And if we can imagine it, right, if we can put together the bizarre scenario in which we end up waiting for somebody who wasn't born at the creation of the interest, that means that the interest is invalid. Okay, so what if Amanda had two children who survived um, at the beginning? All right, so Ben and Jeff, age five and seven. That still gives us the King Ralph problem. It's invalid. What if those two kids are, whoops, why I keep clicking? Um, what if those two kids are almost there? All right, so it looks like it's only gonna be a couple years we still have the King Ralph problem, right? Amanda could have a baby, and then Amanda, Ben, and Jeff could take the family portrait, the final family portrait. Um, that's a King Ralph problem, so it's invalid. What if Amanda's two kids are a little older, Ben is 29 and Jeff is 31? Now we don't have a King Ralph problem anymore because Jeff is already 31. In fact, this interest is vested. 
right? This was the first child to reach age 30, well, one of them already did. So even though it's a future interest, it's a vested future interest, um, and that means we don't have a problem. Okay, let's take a look at Perkins versus Eigelhart. Um, I'm going to stop here and we'll put this in the second half.